Shamal is a South African born sports scientist, psychologist, and high performance coach. He has trained the 2003 Indian World Cup cricket team, Indian Davis Cup team, and many IPL and Kabaddi League teams. And more recently, he is the coach of the Indian football team. He has also worked on the ATP tennis tour for several years with individuals like Mahesh Bhupati, Sania Mirza, and many other international well known established players. His coaching method blends evidence based sports science with modern psychology and spirituality. He is based in Barcelona, and so we had to do this conversation virtually. He shared a lot of tips on biohacking. We spoke about the life skills that can help us thrive in life and how being mentally fit is a function of being physically healthy and how we need to take care of both if you want to live a fulfilling life. So scoot over, watch the episode and keep meditating. Welcome to Pragyan Shamal. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you very, very much. I was excited about this conversation. I'm looking forward to it as well. Uh, there's so much to, to get through and um, I have so many questions for you, not just in terms of, of course, a very important issue called uh, or, or important topic on biohacking, but also just your experience in, in sport and how you've been a coach across uh, various sports, not just tennis, but now you're also coaching with the football team. So, uh, you know, we'll we'll run through all of that and also your own personal journey. Uh, extremely curious about sure. that. So I'd love to talk a little bit more about the few years that you were, uh, you know, in your own uh, uh, monkhood and also just, if, you know, sort of finding your own self. So we'll, we'll go through that as well. But first, just to kick it off, um, you know, yeah, um, I heard you say that you know when you when you face the the big loss of the Indian team, you sort of went into your own reevaluation, and you know you took some time off, and you also had an epiphany which basically spoke about how discipline is sticking to something long enough for it to break you before it actually makes you. And I think discipline is something which is across, right? Whether you're a corporate person like me or a sporting, uh, you know, athlete uh, at a professional level. Has that definition for you in some way changed or has it even become sharper, or even more relevant as you go along the journey? Yeah, I mean, discipline, the, the definition of it has not changed at all. Uh, and thank you for starting there. That was something I said when I discovered spending time in the ashram and, and how I discovered the power of discipline was really repeatedly waking up every single day at 3 a.m. And, and I had initially not bought into the concept of waking up, but I was doing it because everyone around me was doing it. So the first thing I tell everyone is that the ecosystem around you is critically important for you to remain disciplined. If you say that I'm going to do something and I'm seeing this currently where I'm running a 30 day mental toughness challenge with a very intimate cohort and I'm seeing from as early as day two, people are falling off. And the ecosystem is critically important to help you stay disciplined with whatever it is that you want to. Now, the questions that I'm always keep deep diving into. Yes, when you stick to something long enough, it breaks you before you see the power of it really rebuild and come together and forge who you are. What has also become a caveat to me over the last two decades of this quote being said is that I often question myself and I wonder is discipline even possible without the ecosystem in place? You know, so for example, and, and, and remember ecosystem is everything in your external environment. It could be the people you're living with. It could also be your followers on Instagram or LinkedIn. They all make your ecosystem and your ecosystem provides a, a level of nourishment, but it also provides a level of motivation and a level of support. Now, if you say that you want to do something and you attribute that behavior pattern to you acquiring something, maybe more followers, maybe more knowledge, maybe more this. If I remove all of the variables from the environment, which means if I take out everyone you were speaking to or everyone who follows you, or if I take out the environment that, of people, do you have the capacity to still maintain that and find internal intrinsic motivation to do that? That's the question that I'm keep understanding right now. And, and I think for most people, it's very, very incredibly difficult to maintain anything independent of an ecosystem or an environment. And like I said, you may find like-minded, like-hearted people supporting you and doing the same thing. But a lot of people's motivation to do it is because they've linked it to a reward. 
you know, and and I keep questioning myself as to whether the discipline that's linked to a reward is it actually discipline or is it a part of a learned behavioral skill that you would use for anything? And what's the difference between doing that, between waking up at 4 a.m. every single day versus showing up at work every single day? You know, it's it's exactly the same in the sense that when you are not needed to do it anymore, you'll stop doing it. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, so this is where I am with, with respect to, to discipline. And I keep pulling away at the subject and at the topic to understand it better. Because as a specialist of understanding the mind and understanding personality, I'm always trying to take any particular subject and try to look at its applications and implications on the conscious and the subconscious mind and look at where is, uh, how do we weave the needle through that? Oh, very interesting. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, I, I have also realized in my own journey that just setting up many more accountability loops around me, what you're talking about in terms of ecosystem, for me is a lot around accountability where, um, you know, if I, yeah. if I need to show up for a run or an exercise routine or uh, anything else which I find difficult to do on my own, if I have someone along with me, either a friend or a trainer or a, or a partner in, in playing that sport, it just makes it a lot more easier or rather I am far more committed to showing up when that accountability loop is there. And just talking about the ecosystem, I also heard you say when you were training the the tennis team for the Beijing Olympics, things were pretty bad. And then you you saw them in the London Olympics, and you had hoped for better, but things had only gotten worse. Uh, and now that you're training, you know, the football team, do you just generally feel that the quality of the ecosystem that you're referring to for us to actually unlock the potential is far better, or there's still a long way to go? In India, we've definitely got a very, very long way to go. There's no two questions about that. What we have done really well over the last decade, from the time I set foot in the country in 2007, and, I, I, and I'd seen the first three Olympics very, very closely, right up until Rio, and, and we had great results in Tokyo. The one thing that was has been taken care of is the physical training is really, the bar has been raised on that. The bar has definitely been raised on creating and creating access to quality coaching and quality expertise to help bridge that gap. So we've ticked those two. We have definitely raised the bar on, on nutrition as well. You know, So when you come to the physical aspects and the technical aspects, we've totally raised the bar on that. There's no two questions about it. Where we are lacking is uh, understanding how to build systems that create intrinsic motivation for the athletes to drive beyond their personal best uh, or their current personal best. And we've definitely done very, very little in understanding the mental aspect of sport and helping an athlete understand their own mind well enough so that they understand how to consume information, how to interact with that information, how to use that information for their best results. That we've not even scratched the surface of just yet, you know, even when you take basic assessments, like I, I, I interact with a lot of psychologists and most of the psychologists, quite honestly, are talking only about mental health. You know, that seems to be a trending topic. So everyone's talking about mental health. Now, the truth is that uh, performance, when you're trying to perform, you are on a completely opposite spectrum to survival, which is the mental health component of it. It's completely different. If a person's even in that component of survival or trying to just show up every single day, they're very, very far away from reaching the upper limits of their potential and performance. So, you know, I'm not, it's a very, very important subject. I just don't know if the people who are working with professional athletes on a day-to-day -day basis are the people who should be addressing that subject or should they be channeling their energy towards understanding the psychometric and psychological markers that can help that athlete outperform where they currently are as opposed to survive. And, and one of the big problems I have as a psychologist working with sport is mixed language, mm. is that we tend, to, we tend to borrow language from any trending subject at the time, forgetting that every single language has certain notions attached to it, and those notions are seeds to certain belief systems. So, for example, if you start talking about mental health, need, 
mental health when you when you're working with an athlete who needs to perform right you you're sowing the seed of making them think hey listen i'm not well or or you know you, you're giving the seed where you're asking certain questions when that shouldn't even be on the spectrum at all you know and if it's on the spectrum uh you are not as a performance psychologist you are not the person who should address it like for example i could give you broad definitions around mental health i could give you interventions around it am i the person who will help my athlete overcome a problem around mental health the answer is no why because i am a i'm the person they come to to outperform you know That's true. so i can't be i can't be giving mixed signals it's like a swimmer if you take a swimmer and you throw him in the swimming pool and you give him toys to play with he loses that edge with being sharp where it needs to compete you know so we don't play and compete in the same environment similarly yeah. as a therapist who's working you got to be very mindful of the language you use because it sends mixed signals to the person you're talking to so coming back to the subject of india we've ticked a few boxes and we're moving forward quite nicely the areas that are gaping holes is definitely the the mental aspect to it and also there's a lot of technological advancement that can come into sort of equipment and things like that yeah very interesting you say that because you know in india is where all the meditative practices really began and yet you know um, i think when you talk about mental well being it's literally the edge um, you know which which a winner has because at at the level that you're talking about in terms of sport physical abilities are 99% there right everyone's being if you're talking about golf because that's what i understand well is everyone's being able to hit the same kind of shots uh, you know hit the sweet spot as well but what really makes a difference between uh, a tiger woods who consistently wins uh, most tournaments that he shows up to compared to anyone else is really that mental edge that you're talking about and you know you um, came up with this very interesting technique where you combined mindfulness with meditation and is there more can you can you talk a little bit more about that technique and how you've seen that play out um for athletes to thrive because what you were mentioning is you know you need to go to just survive which is one side where i'm i'm feeling low i want to yeah. go through my challenges that is when i go to a therapist but, but if i want to really thrive and outperform and be the best version of myself that's when the athlete should show up and talk to you so what does that look like yeah you know but staying with golf gary play was the one who said that you know the greatest gift that you can sort of cultivate in yourself is the ability to forget the shot you just made you know that's what it is the mistake you made wipe that slate clean and literally that's what we're trying to do with all professional athletes so we're looking at routines that that they use in training and we're looking at how can we interject a very simple practice it could be a breathing technique it could be a bliss narrative where we've trained the brain to recognize even something like a snap of a finger or a pinch of their finger we've trained them to recognize that signal and we've linked that signal to a long exhalation so that it re- resets the body and mind at that point in time and that's what we're trying to do we're trying to reset the brain to a point of neutral in between every single point and in between every single point shot this is something that's not well understood amongst a lot of coaches and psychologists come in and that's what psychologists are really doing uh this is a gaping hole for example in india that we can close is teaching people how to rewire and reset the mind at that and and i find a lot of our athletes are, are doing well but we coming from a place of having to prove others wrong so the internal drive and the mission is very very hard which means we could get to the end line but it's emotionally and physically very exhausting when we get there and the probability of repeating that again is very very low. So the example you mentioned of Tiger Woods, what makes Tiger Woods exceptional wasn't that he won one Masters or he won one Open, you know, it was that he repeated it consistently for a decade. It's the same thing that makes a Rafa or a Roger and a Novak so great. Same thing that makes Steffi Graf so great, same thing that made Usain Bolt so great is the ability to repeat a so system and a process over an entire decade. Now if you don't have a reset mechanism in your place to deal with external stress and clear out bad performances then what's going to happen is if you're relying only on internal drive to prove someone wrong 
you're going to be exhausted. There's absolutely zero chance of you repeating that performance consistently over the decade. You know, so that's what we are trying to do. We're trying to teach people how do you reset the mind? How do you reset the body? And athletes are, are creatures of habit. That's what's the best part of working with an athlete. They will do the same warm up. They'll practice at the same time. They use the same equipment. They'll hit the same shots. They'll do everything. So for us to add a new piece of information in there that completely changes the outcome is very easy. Having said that, that's what makes life so difficult for every other person in the world is they have zero routines. They don't do any two things exactly the same, whether it's meditation, whether it's writing, whether it's journaling, whether it's exercise, you know, and, and the brain operates on routine. If you don't have routine, you cannot optimize it. You can only optimize a system. So that's what helps athletes is because we have systems in place. So optimizing the system becomes very easy. So you're, you're so right, Shamal, about what you said. Uh, you know, when I used to play a little, a little bit of golf, uh, one of the triggers that I had uh, to be in that present was the vel- Velcro of the glove. You know, you you we wear a, a glove on the on the left hand, and the minute I would shut that, it has a particular sound and made me feel like, okay, this is it. I'm in this present moment, and this is the shot I need to play. Doesn't matter what I shot on the last hole or whether the ne- this particular shot is for me to win the tournament because that can add a lot of pressure. But just that I need to execute this to the best ability. And one thing that helped me get into this present state was a lot of meditation that I was doing. And I've heard you say that, you know, just the meditative state and the flow state have very similar waves in the mind. You know, the brain waves that they create are very similar. Have you really seen uh, meditation playing an important role in unlocking this performance in various sport uh, athletes that you worked with? Yeah, you're 100% right. If you look at the brain from a neuroscience point of view and you study the the brain waves in flow states and you study the gamma waves in meditative state, there's very, very strong uh, correlation and inference between these two. And this is beautiful research done by Setsik Mihali, the late scientist who wrote, he wrote the book Flow, where he describes that. The one aspect that's not really spoken about too much is something called transference. Transference means that how do you take a skill from a very, very practiced, from a very protected ecosystem or environment into an environment where there's multiple variables you need to deal with and manage and still have the same benefit from it. So how do you take a meditation practice that's done in solitude alone early in the morning when your house is quiet and you've got great music onto the golf course where there are 20,000 fans and you need to hit one shot on the 18th green. That is called transference of skill. And that's something that we train and we practice. Now, this is what most people don't try to train. And this is what most people don't even understand how to integrate into their practice, whether you're an athlete or whether you're a corporate person. You know, I find a lot of people doing a lot of meditation practices doing that, but they're not finding the benefits of it or they're finding a very subtle benefit to it because the component of transference is not present. And in sports psychology, transference is everything. So whether we're learning a new skill, whether we're bringing in a practice, we try to train it and teach it in a very, very protected environment, in an environment that we are in control of. And then we start to introduce variables slowly into this and that those variables could be the playing field, it could be sound variables, it could be smell, it could be taste, anything that could potentially be a distraction. We start to introduce it in there whilst they're doing the same skill. And we try to teach their mind to remain present in the presence of distraction, to remain present in the presence of distraction is what we're trying to do. And that that's really transference. And that's what we are trying as hard as possible to coach in, in all of these athletes. The other one interesting thing is that uh, a lot of people look at sport and they look at the life lessons and the learnings from it, what professional athletes do, and they try to mimic that in their world. The thing is that sport's a finite game rule. You know, you know you're only playing 18 holes. You'd have to play it over four days. You know after two rounds, you'll miss the cut or you'll make the cut. 
You know what the distance is from the tee box to the green. You already know what the elevation, you know what the stint reading is. You know what the blade of grass, you know what the weather conditions are. You know what club you have in your hand. You know everything. You even at any one point know how far you are from the leader or how far you are leading from. That's a finite game rule. Very, very easy to win and to outperform in a finite game rule. Life is not so much a finite game rule because there's no book to say and people are playing by a different set of rules. That's where it becomes incredibly difficult. And that's the stresses that people struggle to grapple with and come to terms with is when there's a stress in an infinite game rule, which is life that keeps getting thrown at them. Now, how do you circumnavigate for that there is you build internal, emotional and physical resilience. Physical resilience is the number one thing. That's where most people get it wrong. If you look at the rise of chronic diseases, diabetes, hypertension, the over-medication in India, especially of things like antibiotics, these are all dropping our immunity. They're all compromising our body. If the body is compromised, the mind is going to be compromised. You're not going to have a healthy mind in a sick body because pain is the first destruction. Leave everything externally to you. If your body is sick, if you are struggling, if you are, have fatigue, if you can't focus, that becomes the first destruction. So to circumnavigate this, the first thing is we need to build what's called physical capacity and physical resilience. After that, you can start building mental resilience and emotional resilience. But resilience through the word capacity is very important. And, and everyone seems to understand it from the physical sense. We understand that, hey, listen, uh, if you got injured and you hurt your back, you can't play, you can't manage that same workload. You go back to the physio, physio gives you basic exercises. You start using resistance bands or weights and over a period of three weeks or six months, you're increasing it. And what are you doing? You're building capacity in your muscle to withstand greater loads. Now, everyone gets that from a physical sense. When I ask people, okay, how do you build mental capacity because your brain's a muscle? How do you build emotional capacity they have absolutely no way. And if you have no way to build it, the only way it gets built is when life throws a curveball at you and you're in that situation. But then there's a high cortisol increase in your body where you're trying to survive and not trying to thrive in those situations. So this is why most people get stuck repeatedly in these situations. Very well said. I mean, uh, there's so much in there. I think, you know, when you spoke about transfer, especially, um, just making that transition, you know, an average golfer will always come to you and tell you, you know, Shamal, I was hitting the ball flush on the range and now I'm on the golf course and I just can't get it together. And you're like, yes, because that's the skill that you're talking about in terms of transference of this very relaxed state that I've created in the on, on the practice ground where there are there are no odds on the shot. Whether winning or losing, there are no odds. So the pressure is so much less that you just can play better. But that's not the same on the golf course um, or in competition. Yeah. And how do you then really sort of some tips and tricks that you might have that you have seen work in making this transference happen? Because that is not just going to help somebody get better at sport. But like you rightly pointed out, even in life, like how do you maintain that meditative state through the day. It's not something you do half an hour, half an hour in the morning and then come out and, you know, be angry and be all over the place. Yeah. So I, I generally bring in something called a penalty for failure. A penalty for failure is an exercise that I personally do that teaches the brain to have skin in the game with something. So for example, because in life, if you make a mistake, there's a, there's a penalty for that failure. In, in golf, if you hit it in the water, the penalty is you have to drop a shot. So if you are practicing and you hit it in the water, it can't be as simple as, okay, drop another ball, just hit it again, and the second shot is great. Completely wipe out, hey, listen, I made this me. You've got to teach your brain that, listen, okay, fine, it made that mistake. It can't make that mistake again. So you could bring in a penalty, and a penalty for failure could be something physical, like an exercise. It could be something financial where you make a donation to somewhere. And, and the number of barriers you create using these penalties for failures, they start to create guardrails for your brain on what it can do, what it can't do, and when it should focus. The more guardrails you create, you'll find you're able to sort of channel your focus in some shape or form. And so I'm not going to ask like a golfer to go and create guardrails for every single shot. 
But for example, if you happen to be a scratch golfer who is playing on a on a par 72 course, for example, you know, then there has to be a penalty for failure if, if you shoot 73, you know, because at where you are, you should be coming off that course at par or one under, you know, because then you're playing to your sort of handicap in some shape and form. But if you think it's okay to walk off with a 74 or a 75 and completely accept it, then your brain thinks it's okay as well. Now, what skin in the game is your brain have to be hyper-focused the next time you walk in there and do that? And this is the exact same reason why I don't allow any of my golfers to walk into a range uh, or walk into a course and play two balls in the course. I'm saying, hey, listen, we're going to play one ball. And if you hit it, we drop it and we keep going, but we're playing one ball. There's no such thing as dropping another ball here and I miss it this one. Going. Why? Because you have to disassociate the area where you can practice from the area where you need to compete. And if you merge these two here, right, you will struggle to find hyper-focus in those moments that you really, really need to. And this is what people, everyone needs to learn, that your mental toughness is directly proportional to the exercises, the tools, and the messages that you tell your brain on a day-to-day -day basis. And running parallel with that is your brain health. And your brain health is directly proportional to the food you give it, for example. So, you know, your brain has to love the food you give it as much as you love that food. If you eat good nutrients, if you eat, for example, DHA, omega, EPA, you have theanine, which calms the brain down, you have ginkgo bulbo, you have brahmi, all these are great brain nutrients. Then all of a sudden you'll find your ability to focus will be far greater. So your brain health nutrition will then start to support your mental toughness program and they'll come together. There. If you don't, if you look at them separately, you'll always be running in, in parallel tracks and they'll never interject. Uh, and that interjection point is transference, very, very simply. Yeah, very, very nicely put. And I think now sort of, you know, what you've been passionate about just in terms of uh, biohacking fits in very well. Because see, for someone like me, um, it's just about making more mindful choices is how I see or I've broken down sort of what biohacking means. And, you know, one of the things I did was started to wear a garment in the beginning of this year because I felt like if I'm not measuring uh, my sleep or my number of steps, there's no way I'm going to be able to fix it. Um, so tell me something about just when you spoke about nutrition and also just daily health, what are some of the things that you have started to do in your life as well, which has improved your life? And also separately, you know, the folks you coach, what are some of the frameworks you create for them? So, I mean, you start off in a really, really interesting way. You talked about you wearing the garment. So biohacking is a quantified science, which means we quantify almost everything we possibly can from the milligrams of supplements we take to how our body is responding. And the input is quantified against the output. And that's how we're able to sort of titrate what we're doing. So for me personally, look, I have a chorus that I wear that tracks all my running, that tracks every single thing. I have a whoop that tracks my sleep and my strain at any one time. I've been wearing two digital trackers and sometimes I compare the difference in inference between the data points as well. I would wear a, I'm not even diabetic, but I'd wear a CGM say once every two to three months just to see how my body is responding. I check my body fat, my lean muscle mass and my weight every single day. That way there I'm able to understand the implications of any food choices I've made on my body and my health. Then I'm looking at micro details with respect to training and all of this sort of comes together. Everything that I do for me, I do with my athletes. Everything that I do for me, I do with my clients as well. Tracking them is critically important. Now, most people, when it comes to tracking, think, hey, listen, I'll, I'll lose 10 kgs before I start weighing myself. That's the worst thing you could do because every 100 grams you lose is a small win. And the more small wins you see yourself getting, the body feels and the brain feels motivated to keep peak around that journey. So data is a very, very important thing. One is it allows you to make informed decisions about the choices you're making on a day-to-day -day basis. The second thing that data does is it lets you know, hey, listen, I'm moving in the right direction. And, and it becomes your first accountability buddy. You become accountable to yourself as opposed to having someone externally who's going to be accountable or you need to be accountable to. So 
Biohacking is a very, very fascinating science. Uh, I use it in all shapes and forms, from nutrition, supplementation, to the room temperature, to the bed, to the clothing that I'm using. I have a whole bunch of devices that I play with and I try to experiment with. And, and I found beautiful things work in different shapes and forms. For example, one of the devices that I wear on a simple chain, uh, it's called a Kumoso, K-U-M-U-S-O. It's a tiny little thing. It looks like a flute. So it's a, it's a Japanese technology that was just brought in because what they discovered is that when you do a long exhalation, you could probably exhale for about six to maybe 10, 12 seconds, depending who you are, right? But if you're blowing through a whistle, that 12 seconds could become 30 to 40 seconds, as you see with great flutists and trumpets and stuff like that. So the exhalation through blowing is exactly the same as a slow breathing exhalation. And the longer it is, the greater the impact in the parasympathetic and nervous system and the vagus nerve. So this is a simple device. So now I don't even try to meditate. I just keep this device with me. And literally every time I'm walking anywhere, I'm just, it's in my mouth. I'm just blowing, blowing. And every single breath just keeps bringing the, the nervous system down. And then I'm able to see the impact of that stress on my work. So I'm seeing that over the last one year of doing this, I don't cross 1.5 out of 3 on a stress level, irrespective of what I'm going through, irrespective of my travel schedule, how much I'm working. And uh, so, so you can see the impact of small changes that are being made on the body all the time. So I want to break this down and ask you, <clears throat> what are some of the hacks that you've seen in the body, which is the physical stuff that can help? Second, just nutrition, uh, because, you know, now a lot of us are taking a bunch of supplements and yet we don't know whether what we're taking works, doesn't work. So anything that you've seen, you know, since you're an expert. And then thirdly, just what hacks have you seen for the mind, right? Beyond meditation, is there anything else I heard you talk about just blowing and helping the uh, helping calm the mind down. But is there anything else uh, that you feel as an amateur or, or as someone who's just starting out on this journey that I can think about? Yeah. So the biggest problem that most people have is not not is not not having information about what to do. It's simply consistency. Hmm. And I think the biggest problem that people have is we need to make a mental switch around supplementation. They think, they think that supplementation is a shortcut or a hack to bad life decisions. And it's not, you know, I, I keep saying, Hey, you know, yes. Uh, and one of the best examples is, I mean, even though Lance Armstrong has been stripped of all his titles because of the blood doping and stuff, I said, you know, he still did 100% of the work. It helped him get a micro shift, which won him that title. Right. And, but you got to do the work first. You know, it's not going to take a person off the street who just does that same technique and they're going to win the Tour de France. There is no getting around work. And that's what people seem to forget. Right? So the first thing is, and, and, and I was saying this to my athletes, I was coming out of the football uh, field the other day and we had a, a relatively hard loss to swallow against Iraq in the King's Cup. And this was as recent as last week. And... Uh, we went one up. And remember, Iraq is the number two country in Asia. And eight countries from Asia could qualify for the World Cup. So this was a really good asset test for us in terms of where India stands in relation to qualifying for the World Cup. Everyone expected us to lose three or four nil because we are number 99 at that stage. They were literally, I think, number 70 or 69 in the world, ranked two in Asia. Okay. We went one nil up first. And then there was a penalty given against us. We went 2-1 up and there was another penalty given against us. And eventually it went to a penalty shootout and we lost 5-4. Losing in penalties is always hard. But when we came back to the locker room, the question that we asked was, hey, did everyone who took the field, did you have 1% more to give? Could you have sprinted a little harder once? Could you have taken a dive once? Could you have done anything more? that could have just shifted the outcome. And a lot of hands went up where they said yes. And this is so critically important because one of the most difficult things to bring a person back from is the emotion of regret, right? And what is regret? Regret is the knowledge that I didn't do what I could have done to get that outcome. And when you realize you're so close yet so far, 
that's the birthplace of regret. And it's very difficult to coach a person who has even an iota of regret in there. So when I'm telling everyone, I said, before you even look at supplements, because the world of supplements is absolutely exhaustive. I mean, you're right. You, you have a handful. A handful is not even enough. You could take a bucket full of supplements every day and you still have another list to go through or blood tests that you could do or genetics tests or microbiome tests or inflammation tests or brain health tests. There's just no end to it. But none of it matters if you're going to make an excuse to not wake up in the morning and move. None of it matters if you're not going to get to bed at the same time. None of it matters if you keep giving yourself a pat on the back and saying, okay, it's Sunday, I'm okay, I'll take it easy. None of it matters if you're going to keep finding an excuse for why you're not showing up. Right? That is the first thing you need to come to terms with. And the truth is that there are only two ways to do it. One is you make an internal life decision that I am absolutely exhausted with where I am in life and I refuse to be here anymore. And then that life decision forges you forward and you show up for yourself every single day. Or the second thing is life is going to give you a kick up your ass, right? And that's going to be a very, very painful way to try to course correct because you're going to be dealing with multiple other variables in there. But most people find themselves at that fork in the road. But nothing, nothing matters. Do not waste your money on anything if you're not prepared to show up for yourself. Because the truth is that, yes, theanine, which is great. I can give you a great brain health supplement. I could say, hey, take Brummi, take Tinko Boba. Those things don't go well with alcohol, you understand? So yeah. if you're not going to give up your alcohol, your brain health supplement's not going to work for you. You know, for example, you could take the best probiotic in the world, but if you're going to drink a Coca-Cola, it's going to erode your stomach acid. It's going to kill the bacteria in there. If you're going to keep medicating every time you have a simple uh, illness or a simple thing, it is going to erode your uh, fauna and flora in your gut. So the point is that you're self-sabotaging your success by life decisions you're making. And biohacking, as much as I do it and as much as I talk about it, I always tell people, if you're looking at this as a shortcut, it's a very, very expensive shortcut to nowhere. So well said. No, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's actually shocking when people continue to make the decisions that they know are the worst thing for them. Um, and I think it also comes back then to self-worth and just investing in the relationship you have with yourself, which you just mentioned, which is anyone in their sane mind would not want to drink every night because they know what it does to their body. And yet we use it as a pathway to escape from stress or anything else in our lives which we don't want to really stand up against or actually work through more importantly. Um, I also want to touch upon what you said about what happened in that locker room about people raising their hands and saying they could have done a lot more. But I also find with athletes, you know, um, because there's such a drive to win that sometimes you push your physical abilities to such a level that you cause injury. Um, and I'll just give you a little bit more context. We had Vishwaraj Jadeja, who's uh, the fastest Indian ice skater uh, on my podcast. And he said, you know, he was preparing for the uh, the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang. And he just kept getting injured. But because of his mental thing about, no, I have to win and I have to keep going, he actually reached a stage where he couldn't even walk and was not able to participate in the Olympics. So where is that fine line of pushing yourself mentally but knowing that this is it, your body can't take much more. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question. Firstly, if you're pushing yourself and you're breaking down and you're nowhere close to winning, then that's the first red flag. Maybe you're just not cut off for it. Maybe your body is not strong enough. And maybe you just can't do this. And that's the first thing you need to accept is, is that maybe that's not it. And if you're constantly breaking down, then there's a million things you can look at to see how the body can become more physically resilient. But it's definitely what was clear is that if you keep getting injured every time you try to raise the bar in capacity, right, and still you know nowhere close to winning, then that's the first big gaping hole that you need to do. And if you want to be a professional athlete, you have to close that or you have to step away from the field. You know, there's no such thing. You cannot say to yourself, hey, listen, I will do a subpar effort and expect to still be present. You're not going to be present. The world's moving forward. Performances are getting faster. People are getting stronger. Things are getting greater. And a subpar performance is just not going to keep you in that same ecosystem. There's nothing you can do about that. 
you know so the first thing is evaluating where you are in relation to how much you prepare to give and where that is getting you right understand that i know a lot of athletes who it took them 15 years before they even won one medal but in that evaluation process they were happy to just show up every day every day every day and do that if you're happy to go ahead by all means you may get to it 15 years later or you may not but that's the journey that you you need to to come to and you need to get to the second thing is you know yes when we look at is it healthy to push the body push the mind you're playing in a sport where the gold is defined you know what you need to do you're going to go to the olympic games you're going to have to run faster than 9.8 9.7 seconds to win the gold now you can't say hey my mental health my coach is pushing me this 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 i'll run at 212 i'll be happy with it and hope to go there and get the gold no that doesn't work life doesn't work like that you know so and unfortunately for me i i'm a little hard and a little cutthroat with this because the point is that the reason i'm hard and cutthroat with it project is that every single time we choose to tell ourselves a different story that allows us to bring a subpar effort to that not only are we jeopardizing our career in that sport we are restricting our opportunity to do something else okay that is the thing that people don't understand that's the thing that people don't get so well said because if you're not number 1 in this you wasting your time being number 99 you might as well do something else where you can be number 1 okay. yeah yeah for sure for sure and being number 2 here is not going to give you the money neither is going to give you the fame neither is going to give you the joy or the fulfillment right so what the hell are you doing here and you're going to be putting in 99% effort to stay at number 2 when you can easily realize hey this is not for me go and do something else right and you'll be far happier far content maybe you make a lot more money maybe you have a better family life more balance it will come with a lot more different challenges challenges but you could find yourself in a better place for sure um i mean i i had to take that decision when i finished playing college and wanted to really evaluate and see am i can i really be the top 10 in the world and it was very clear to me i couldn't be so now i just hustle on the weekends and make some money and i'm happy with that so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah but i i completely hear you um i also want to talk through a little bit about you know how um longevity is is allowing for people to play for much longer and you know some of it could be around what you said which is there's a lot more research happening around the mind and nutrition and and rehabilitation and injury you know you have a jokovic who's winning um consistently even at 36 37 uh you have venus williams who came back and won even after uh, delivering a child so can you tell me a little bit about what does the future of sport a little bit look like and can average amateurs or or people who are just playing sport over the weekend also borrow from that what can we borrow so that we can also ensure we are playing for much longer yeah so the first thing is longevity and performance are two sciences that sit on opposite ends of the scale you know the longevity science means what you doing you sitting in a certain threshold of your heart rate certain threshold of your body metrics which will predispose you to living long so for example you play a racket sport on the weekends you could increase your longevity by almost 25 to 30% <coughs> racket sports uh predispose people to living longer healthier lives compared to any other uh exercise you know whether it could be golf or it could be weightlifting or it could be cardiovascular long distance running which only improves life expectancy by about 18% as such interesting okay. now so this is from a longevity science point of view from a performance science point of view you are training at such a threshold there's a very very catabolic effect to the body this is why recovery is so important to you so every time you go out and you train and you push your body really really hard there's a lot of degenerative uh degeneration happening to your cell tissue which is why the athletes need so much of time to sort of recover as such so where is sport going sport is going firstly djokovic and the federers and stuff are bad examples to to sort of use in this case study you know if we look at it there'd be 10 of these such names uh, across the millions of professional athletes that exist out there so uh where sport is going is that athletes will turn professional far younger 
you know, moving forward. So as early girls, as early as 16 will turn pro, guys as early as 17, 18 will turn pro. Okay. The probability of another Djokovic coming on and still winning till 36 is highly unlikely. The reason why it's highly unlikely is because the advancements in the game and technology is that the youngsters at 16 who are moving faster, hitting the ball, are going to push you far more than it. Now, what you don't see in this entire system is that, <clears throat> and this is something that's really important, is that most systems are rigged to look after champions. You know, so for example, uh, yeah, so for example, uh, let's let's take Djokovic for an, as an example. Djokovic will go into a Grand Slam, right? And in Grand Slams, you don't get first round buys, so you got to play. But in the Master Series event, he would get a first round buy. A first round buy would give him something like I think uh, 120 or 160 points. Okay. Now, for an amateur tennis player who's starting off, he will have to play a challenger event or a futures event. He'll have to win four games. Right before he wins five points, he'll have to win four of those tournaments, get 20 points before he even gets an invite into a challenger sort of event. He'd have to win on some and substance. If you do the math, that guy would have to win about 40 games before he even gets to a master series event, not even a grand slam, a master series event. Now, so when I say the system's rigged, the system is rigged to protect the people right at the top because they get what's called first round buys. First round boys carry a lot of points. Then they're playing an unseeded person. So it's designed because of marketing for the top eight to top 10 players to always get to the quarterfinals and semifinals where you're making the most money and getting the most points. And for someone to break into that requires consistent performances over an entire year just to break in there. And once you break in there, then you will also be protected by the system. So when you look at a person lasting so long, you know, what you're seeing is a byproduct of a few things. You're seeing a byproduct of experience, practical knowledge. You also see the byproduct of when you get to that level, you've got a far more uh, disposable income and resources and a bigger team looking after you. But it's also you cannot discount the invisible energy of the system looking after champions across all sports. Yeah, I mean, I never thought of it like that. Yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, and about young players, you know, Alcaraz, you could see how he was pushing Djokovic. My God, he really gave him a run for his money. Yeah, yeah. Um, Alcaraz is, is an amazing talent, for sure. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot more of him, right? Just uh, really pushing uh, all the legends. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, just, um, I also want to talk through a little bit on you know, how losing or rather I would say defeat is more often uh, in sport than winning. You know, you are, you're going to find your, yourself maybe losing more often. I mean, even like somebody like a Tiger Woods, uh, I think has an approximate 22% win rate. Um, and we think of him as somebody who is unbeatable. How do you then help your um, athletes come out of that dark place to show up again the next day and really also peak in those important tournaments or in those important moments? So, I mean, we don't really think of failure as failure, you know, in every single practice, an athlete will fail 500 times. So what is a failure as a golfer? A failure is, hey, I, I didn't hit the ball flush or it didn't land within two feet of where I wanted to. If you call that a failure, how many times when you go to the range do you fail? Hundreds of times. How many times on a golf course do you fail? Hundreds of times, you know? You, you, so, so you're right. There's a large amount of failure, but we don't consider it a failure. We don't look at it as a failure in that. And the second thing is that the athletes, when I came back earlier on and I said the average person doesn't put enough emphasis on the physical body, this is where athletes have a one-up, is that their default mechanism is movement. So whenever they feel like something bad's happened, and that bad thing could be divorce or the loss of a loved one or anything, the first thing they do is take their clubs or they put on their running shoes and hit the road. And moving creates this endorphin release in the body that completely raises and elevates them out of that emotional state. So this is where athletes have a one-up on everyone else, is that the default mechanism is movement. So what we try to do when anyone does is the very, very next day, we go out again. 
If it's footballers, we have a practice in the morning or we go for a run. If it's golfers, we take them out, we go and hit a few balls on the range. You know, we get them back into feeling what it's like to do what they love. But the secret is do what you love. Most people don't even know what they love. That's the problem. They don't love showing up at work, but they do that for eight hours a day. You know, so how do you help someone who spends 80% of their day doing something they don't love? This is why if there's one thing you want to help people with is help them discover what they truly love and then find out how to create space for them to actually do that. Yeah, no, we do that a lot. Actually, a lot of the questions I ask are around that. And which is why my next question is going to be, how did you discover what you absolutely love? Because you seem extremely passionate and, um, and the only way you can be so good at what, at, at what you do, which you are, is when you want to do it every day and doesn't feel like work. Um, so how do you discover what you do today? I mean, I've, I've been an athlete my whole life. I played cricket when I was young. I played in various systems. And, and then because of the apartheid, I, I couldn't continue for, 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 for reasons of the apartheid. So I moved straight into coaching. I was very, very passionate about it. But even along my journey, you know, 25 years ago, I probably thought uh, the body was the most important thing and muscle physiology was the most important thing. And then I migrated and understood meditation and then I migrated and understood everything. So I have a deep passion in understanding performance, you know, of the human body and the human mind, but not, uh, but also being able to connect various systems together. You know, and understand it from that point of view. I find that, you know, in this day and age, there are a lot of people who are super specialists who can talk about a particular subject and go way deeper than I possibly can about that there. But the body is a myriad of systems and these systems are all interconnected. It's like roots coming out of a tree, you know, and, and all of these systems must come together to feed that one thing. So that's where my uh, strength lies. My strength lies in understanding all of the systems and understanding, okay, this is how they borrow and this is how they lend to each other. And this is where they really need to come together. And uh, you're 100% right. I think one of my, my big secrets is I don't spend a lot of time working the whole day. I take a lot of time to understand, to research, to write, to, to, to figure out this. I watch a lot. I spend a lot of time with coaches and athletes just standing there. Sometimes I don't even say a word just looking at them, peeling away the layers of how they think. Uh, like one particular example was I remember at, at a practice when we were in Bhubaneswar, I spent 45 minutes just talking to Sunil Shetri, right? just understanding what goes through his mind in the three seconds before he kicks a penalty. Probably one of the best penalty kickers I've ever seen in my life. I spent 45 minutes just saying, hey, okay, just, just doing this. And then off that 45 minutes, we spent – no exaggeration. We spent about 10 minutes just looking at the ball on the spot, right? And just on the way it's placed and how it's lying in the grass in relation to everything, how much of information is pulling into that. Similarly, when, when a golfer walks around the cup, what he sees, he can write an encyclopedia. On, and that's the level of detail that people need to start seeing. Most people are looking, but they're not seeing. And that's fundamentally the biggest problem. Yeah, I mean, very well said. And I, I totally understand that. And I think that's a skill subconsciously I bring to my work because that's the work ethic or that's the discipline with which I have grown up playing sport where you just go down uh, to the detail and you also don't sort of give up or let go. Uh, and you just find different ways to access the same problem because if you're hitting the same yeah. roadblock and you're say, taking the same path, you're going to hit the same roadblock. You got to take another way to get to the same place. Uh, you know, it's maybe not hitting that shot over the water hazard. If every time you're hitting the water hazard, maybe it's just hitting the center of the green and saying, I'm going to putt well and sing that birdie instead of constantly attacking that pin. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is, it's, I very often think of that, right? When, when Tiger is, is on that shot or when for that matter, you know, when you have to, uh, hit that winning penalty because both these things are very similar. Because in like, unlike other sport, you're constantly reacting to your opponent. In this, you're actually just all by yourself and you've got to execute that shot all by yourself. And that's when a lot of anxiety and a lot of insight chatter, your mind chatter goes on. Are there any things, that, any tips that you give or anything that you share beyond meditation, which is a more long term, but in that moment when you need to hit that shot and it's just endless, how do you, how do you regulate your mind? 
So I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to regulate the mind. I'm, I'm just coming down to the person's ability to execute, mm. you know. So, for example, you can go to the flag and I'll encourage you to go for the flag if you can hit me 25 draws exactly the same, you know, and hit the same distance. If you can't do the basics right, champions do the basics the best. You can't do the basics right, then you can't expect to hit that flag. It's pure luck. You understand. So, and there's a beautiful saying, you know, amateurs do it till they get it right and professionals do it till they can't get it wrong. So that's the difference. The difference is that, you know, like, like when Sunil is standing at the penalty thing, he's kicked 1,000 balls. I've seen it. Tiger is standing there. It looks like a great shot. He's hit that shot a thousand times. The exact same shot. Is it a thousand times? He has absolute conviction. If you ask him, hey, listen, will you bet your house on you landing within two feet? Yes, he would. 100%. He would do that. If you take ask me, hey, how much would you bet on you scoring this goal? He would bet his life on it. Why? Because he's done it so many times. You ask an average person. So when you are standing across that there, ask yourself, would you bet your house on you landing? And if the answer is no, you've just not done enough work. End of story. So true. You know, and there's, and there's no mental hack for that. You've not done enough work, period. So go hit some more balls, practice, and that's when trust in yourself and your ability develops. And from okay. there, yeah. there is no anxiety because you know you've done it a thousand times, so you can do it again, right? It's no big yeah. deal. Correct. Makes Correct. a lot of yeah. sense. No, but thank you so Correct. much, uh, Shamal, for this conversation. It was very insightful. I really appreciate the time you gave us. Thanks a ton. No thank you so much. Look after yourself. See you.